If you've got a Bible, I want you to turn to two spots. You can open up to Ephesians chapter 1, and you can put a marker in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start in Ephesians 1. We're going to wrap up this message in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, we are starting a new series this weekend entitled Anchored. And this series, just to give you a heads up, is, is a little more in the deep end of the theological pool. All right? You're going to have to put your learner hat on for the next month and a half. It's going to be a lot of fun. There will be a twist to this series theologically. So for those of you who, when you hear this is going to be in the deep end of the pool theologically, you start, your eyes start getting heavy and you start getting a little... It's not going to be like that. There's a twist. And Ephesians chapter 1 gives us the why behind this series being so theologically... Uh, deep really isn't the right word, but just robust. But also, Ephesians 1 gives us the, uh, the twist behind it. And most people see the why, but they don't catch the twist, all right? So I want to see this in your own Bible. If you don't have one, you can just look on the screen in front of you. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 16. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight. Here's the why. So that you might grow. Remember, grow, growth is one of the values of our church here. We're called to grow. Paul says, I beg God to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow. Grow in what? In your knowledge of God. Now take the verse off of the screen there for a moment. Because that's where most people stop when they think about theology, that it's the knowledge of God. Here's what the word theology means, the study of God. Not the knowledge of God, the study of God. And let me make a statement, and if you're taking notes, in the notes we handed out to you, you can fill in the blank here. If you are a lover of God, you are called to be a studier of God. Preston, it's student of God. Yeah, but student doesn't rhyme with lover, so I made up a word and studier. If you are a lover of God, you're called to be a studier of God. Let me explain. When I proposed to my wife, Holly, about 20 years ago now, uh, I got down on one knee and first begged her and Second, I said to her, babe, I will spend the rest of my life learning everything there is to know about you. And by the time I die, I make a commitment to you. I will know more about you than any other human being on this planet called Earth. Because I'm obsessed with you. No one, not even your own mother and father, will know more about you by the time I die than me. I will know more. Why? Because that's what love does. Love is an obsessed learner. And, and a lover desires to learn everything they possibly can about the object of their love. Listen, that's what theology is meant to be. It's meant to be you saying, not, I want to intellectually know more about God. It's meant to be a statement where you say, I want to obsessively learn all there is to know about God because I know the more I learn about God, the more in love I fall with him. That's what theology is. And that's what this entire series is going to be about. It's holding up things many of us have, have been taught for years, but looking at it just a little bit of a different way to see if we can catch a glimpse of his face that we haven't ever seen before. That's when theology is at its best. And if we're going to do a series that is in the deeper end of the theological pool, we must, when we talk about anchoring our lives on the foundation as Christ followers, we must start with the Word of God. So today's message is entitled, Anchored in the Word of God. Anchored in the Word of God. Now, Psalm 119 is a poem of love for the Word of God. It happens to be the longest chapter in Scripture, and I don't think that's an accident. It's not a coincidence. 
The longest chapter in the Bible has the subject of the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the foundation for our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. And listen to what Psalm 119 says in verse 61. This is kind of the foundation of this message. Evil people try to drag me into sin, but I am firmly anchored to your instructions. Evil people are trying to drag me away into sin. But what's keeping me from going, I am anchored to your instructions. Instructions in Psalm 119 is one of the seven or eight different words used to describe the word of God. Because I am anchored in your word, O God, I will not be dragged off by these evil people into sin. Now, in this message, I'm going to give you a couple of things related to the Word of God. And you have to understand, this series, I'm not going for creativity. This is a pretty black and white series, all right? And so the the points are not, they don't rhyme, they they are boring on paper, but they are profound to the soul. Here's point number one. God's Word is truth. God's Word is truth. John chapter 4, verse 24 says, For God is spirit, so those who worship him must. In your notes, underline that word. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Notice that it doesn't say we are to worship God according to the opinion we have that seems right. Or that we are to worship God according to the feeling that seems right. It says, for God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, let me make this statement at the very beginning of this message on the word of God. The Bible is the inerrant and infallible word of God, period, point blank. Period. What does that mean, inerrant? It's without error, infallible. It means it can't contain error. Now, some of us, we're argumentative and, and, and antagonistic, and so we, we like to play devil's advocate, and we say, well, no, I can think of several contradictions in Scripture. Press. Listen, I'm not saying this translation, this present-day translation I have that has been parsed by many men and women over the years is infallible and inerrant. What I'm saying and what we say when we say that the Bible is the inerrant and infallible word of God, the original manuscript inspired by the Holy Spirit given to more than 40 authors is the inerrant and infallible word of God. If we don't start there, our house will collapse. Jesus said, listen, when you're building a foundation for your life, there are only two options. This is Matthew 7. He says, you can build on the rock or you can build on the sand. When you build on the rock, when the storms come, the house is not affected, but when you build on anything other than the rock, not only does it erode at the foundation, it tears down the house. The word of God is the foundation for our lives. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16, says all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture, not some of it, not parts of it, All scripture is inspired by God. The word of God is inerrant and infallible. And let me add a dot, dot, dot to that statement. The internet is not. I know it sounds kind of funny, but you'd be shocked how many times someone sends me an email or asks me a question that starts with, I was reading on the internet the other day. And without realizing it, they're elevating the internet and the partial information and even incorrect information to the same level of scripture. The internet is not inerrant or infallible. Let me go a step further for the young people. Professors are not inerrant and infallible. Some stats say that up to 80% of our young people who go away to a secular institution as a Christ follower, by the time they graduate, up to 80% of our young people say by the time they graduate from a secular institution that they no longer follow Jesus. Why? 
because they get these intellectual professors who spend their lives trying to discredit scripture and because they sound impressive and because our young people don't fully know the strength behind what they believe is not a feeling, but it's a rock. It's not our young people's fault, it's our fault. It's my fault. I've got to do a better job. My competitive side's gotta come out. I don't want some two-bit professor, and I love our professors, but any professor that wants to discredit the word of God is not on my good side. And we need to do something about it. Just because they make a good argument doesn't make it true. I'll, I'll go you one step further while we're here. Pastors are not inerrant or infallible. I'm not talking about the other ones. I'm talking about this one. If you stay here for years, you'll learn something. I, I don't ever want to preach heresy. But I'll tell you this, as I've gotten older, I get a more comprehensive revelation of God's word. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, for we see through a glass dimly. For I know in part and I see in part. I don't know everything. Don't just take everything I say and go, that's inerrant and infallible. No, it's not. This is. Put everything you hear from any pastor up against the word of God. Because only the word of God is inerrant and infallible. I believe that, that the Bible is the most attacked and criticized book on the earth. Scholars are writing books every week to discredit the reliability and the authority of Scripture. But this has been going on since the beginning. This is not new. Think about this. Go back to Genesis 3. What was, was it originally about? Satan comes to Eve, and how does he start the conversation? Did God really say? Satan is fighting over God's word. This is a part of his plan. If he can get you to doubt the word of God, he has gotten you to doubt the God of the word. And when you doubt God's word, you agree with God's enemy. We cannot move off of this. God's word is truth. But some of us act like the Bible is a book filled with human opinions about God. That's simply untrue. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, error, as it relates to any book, typically comes from one of two directions or reasons. It comes from deceit or it comes from ignorance. This is where error comes from, deceit or ignorance. Thankfully, Scripture puts this argument to rest as it relates to the Bible. Think about it. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. For it is impossible for God to lie. So that immediately removes the possibility of deceit from this book. Ignorance. There are plenty of passages. 1 John 3 says God knows everything. He knows everything. So he cannot lie and he knows everything. Listen, here's another way, way to say it. There is no error in God. And since this is God's word and there's no error in God, there is no error in the word of God. It's his word. And we can build our lives on it. Now, I hear a lot of people, uh, when I was studying for this message, at first I was, I was really thinking I was going to go down the line in this first point, which is more than half of this message, of historical reliability. So I was going to lay out all of, of the history that helps us have confidence in the reliability of Scripture. But it became obvious as I was studying. I, I mean, we could talk about how there are over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament going back to 100 years after the life of Christ. And scholars have poured over these over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. And scholars all over the world, not just biblical scholars, historical scholars, 
agree. The Bible is the, the most historically consistent book of all time. We could go down that road. But I want to go down a little bit of a different road. I, I want to build up your confidence in the Word of God based on the authority. I hear people say all the time, uh, I was, I was watching on YouTube, and so-and-so said this about Scripture. And, and it's discrediting a little bit, or, or it's questioning things. I, I heard so-and-so say this about the Bible. Is that true? I heard so-and-so teach this. Is that accurate? Okay, I hear that all the time. If we're going to talk about what so-and-so says about Scripture, why don't we find the number one supreme authority in heaven and on earth and see what they say about it. So let me walk you up to who that is. Some of you might already have an idea of who that is. The Old Testament was the part of the Bible that was written before the life of Jesus, and it was wrapped up about 450 years before his birth. In the Old Testament, there are over 300 what is called predictive prophecies. So prophecies that predict something, and, and these over 300 prophecies all predict something about the coming Messiah. Now, let's separate in the midst of this argument from the spiritual side and let's enter into the mathematical side of the discussion. Mathematicians say that the odds of one person fulfilling eight, just eight, of the over 300 predictive prophecies about the Messiah, that the odds mathematically are one in 100 quadrillion. Just eight. Mathematicians say that the odds of one person fulfilling 48 of the over 300 predictive prophecies of the Messiah's coming. Mathematicians say the odds of that happening are 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Want to take a guess of the odds of one person fulfilling every one of the over 300 predictive prophecies? We don't know because the computer exploded when they tried to figure it out. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And think about this. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, hey, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. When we talk about scripture, I don't want to talk about what so-and-so says about it or so-and-so. I want to go to the preeminent supreme authority in heaven and on earth. So let me just show you the resume of this authority, and let's see what he says about truth and God's word. Here's the first thing Jesus does. Jesus acknowledged he was the son of God. He didn't just say he was the son of God, he acknowledged it. In Matthew chapter 16, this is just one of the many times, but this is one of my favorites, where Jesus is speaking with Peter and he says, hey, Pete, who does everybody say that I am? And he says, well, some say Moses, some say Elijah. And look what happens next. But Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter answers and he says, you're the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, son Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Jesus acknowledged. He didn't just say he was the son of God. I can say I'm the son of God. Jesus affirmed what the father revealed, that he was in fact the son of God. Here's the second thing. Jesus said he was the truth. So when we talk about finding the truth, Jesus says he was the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. When we talk about finding the real truth, and we've got this thing called relativism running around, we've got more relativists than we've ever had on the earth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. You know the funny thing about People who believe in relativism, they all agree to the same speed limit and abide by it. Yet it's their truth and their truth and their truth, yet they all submit to one truth that the local authority established. Listen, you get around people who say, whatever you believe is okay, whatever I believe is okay. No, no, no. No. That doesn't make it true just because you believe it. We have to find the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And that qualified him to make this next statement. Jesus said, God's word is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus is saying to the Father, 
Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Listen, I think it's great to study what people say about Scripture, to even see what people who don't believe in Scripture say about it. It's good to know the arguments against it. But at the end of the day, I don't hang my hat on what anybody else says other than the number one endorsement from the Word of God, and that is the Son of God. If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that He came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for you and your sin, went into the grave for three days and was raised from the dead. If you believe that, why would you believe anything other than what he said when he says, let me clear this thing up. I am the truth. That means I know what the truth is. If anybody's qualified to talk about what truth is, it's me. God's word is truth, period. It was here before me. It'll be here after me. I didn't write it, I can't change it. Truth is truth, and we are called to live by it. And God's word is truth. But here's what may happen from time to time. You may encounter someone who makes a really impressive sounding argument against the reliability of scripture, against the authority of scripture. And I don't care if you forget most of everything else that I say in this message, I want you to remember this. When that time comes, and that person makes a really incredible sounding argument against Scripture, you need to remind yourself, that doesn't make it true. All that means is they know their argument more than you and I have meditated on the truth. And we just need to get into it more. Here's the second point as we talk about God's Word. God's Word is a love letter. God's Word is a love letter. I hear from time to time people talk about Scripture, especially new believers, and say, oh, the Bible's so overwhelming to me. It's, it just seems like it's a book that is filled with I can'ts. I'm not allowed to do this. I'm not allowed to do that. The Bible is not a book of a thousand you can'ts. It's a letter with a thousand pages of God's I do's. It's a love letter. It's not a mean letter from a vindictive father trying to ruin your life. It's a love letter from an obsessed father. Listen to John 1, verse 8. Moses says to Joshua, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Question, if the Bible is such a bad book, why would God, in this passage... Be inspiring someone to say, hey, if you meditate on this book, if you obey everything it says, it will help you succeed and prosper in all you do. If it's such a bad book, how could it produce that kind of fruit? It's not a mean book from a mean father. The Bible is a love letter. John chapter 17, verse 13, Jesus says to the father, now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with joy. What did Jesus tell them? I have given them your word. Jesus gave the disciples around him the word of God so that it would produce joy inside of them. So if you've become convinced that this book produces anything other than joy, just read the book and it'll tell you otherwise. This is not a bad book. From a mean father, it's a love letter from a loving father. Think about it like this. What if I grew up in a day in which there were no televisions, no cell phones, no social media, no way to record my voice or my image, and I found out that I was dying with a, a dreadful disease and it was going to happen quickly. And I made my wife and my children aware and let's say Riley comes to me and she says, Daddy, in tears, I'm afraid I'm going to forget what you sound like. Remember, can't record my voice, can't record my image. What would I do? As a loving father who is obsessed with that little girl, who says, I don't want to forget what you sound like. I want to hear your voice constantly, Daddy. What would a good daddy do? 
a good daddy would sit down and start writing page after page after page after page after page after page. Pages like Psalm 139 that remind that little girl, that little boy, I'm obsessed with you. Every morning you wake up, I'm still there standing over you because that's what daddies do. Listen to me. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is a love letter that your heavenly father gave to you so that any time you wanted to hear daddy's voice, you could. Preston, I have trouble hearing God's voice. No, you don't. Faith comes by hearing. Where does hearing come from? Not from thine ears. From his word. God's word is a love letter. Now, here's point number three, and we're going to we're going to really cram a lot into this point. It's going to be rapid fire. There are like 7,000 subpoints in this point, all right? So that's why we're giving you notes so you can keep up and tag along. Here's point number three. God's word is life. God's word is life. I want to give you some things that Scripture tells us Scripture is likened to, to help us understand the essential nature of this book in our everyday lives, all right? It doesn't just say, hey, read it. God isn't like that. He doesn't just make a command like that, that and say, Preston, read this book. No, no, no. He, he's not trying to be intense towards me, yelling at me. He's trying to entice me and entice you into reading this book. Listen to how scripture describes this book. Here's the first, kind of starting entry level. The Bible's described like milk. Like milk. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. This is good news when we first get saved. When we're young in the faith. We can't handle filet mignon all the time. Our spiritual digestive system isn't ready for it. In the same way, what would happen if you took a three-week-old baby and fed it filet mignon? They probably wouldn't use a diaper for a week and a half. They'd be backed up. So what do we give them? We give them milk. Here's another way to say that. The Bible isn't for smart people. The Bible is for God's people. You don't need to have a PhD to enjoy this book. You just need to have love for the author. And, and let me say this, because you may have heard some people say from time to time that there are over 40 authors of this book. That's completely untrue, and it's the wrong way to say it. They probably don't mean what they're actually saying. There are over 40 writers of this book, but there's only one author. There's only one author. That's what we read in, in 2 Timothy 3. The Holy Spirit inspired this book. And it's like milk. Here's the second thing scripture is likened to, bread, carbs. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them to see, if, see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Now heading into the New Testament, Matthew 4, 4, Jesus speaking to Satan, he says, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. When Jesus in Matthew 6 is teaching us how to pray, he says, when you pray, pray like this, give us this day our daily bread. This is meant to be a daily meal our daily bread. Have you ever been around somebody who gets a little uh, feisty when they haven't had a meal in a while? Maybe you are that person. What's the term for it? Hangry. Like in the last decade, this has actually become a thing. That it, all, all this intermittent fasting, of course everybody's hangry. We're starving ourselves. Hangry. I want you to think about something for a minute. No wonder there's anger in the house of the Lord and in the family of God. Because I think there's a bunch of hangry humans in the house of the Lord who haven't been getting near enough of their daily bread. 
Of course you send mean emails to me. Of course you want to punch me. You haven't had a meal in two weeks. I'm not picking on you. I get the same way. I'd want to punch me too. But I am not your problem. Your appetite is. Listen, if the only time you eat this book is in this room, you're going to starve spiritually. God created us to live by this meal daily because it's our bread. Here's the third thing the Bible's likened to meat. Protein. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food. The original language says meat. Not with meat. Not the meat of scripture because you weren't ready for anything stronger. Anybody that works out knows that in order to build muscle, you need what? Protein, right? Carbs aren't going to help you build muscle. They're actually going to hide your muscle. <laughs> Protein helps you build muscle. Okay, if you're taking notes, write this one down. Spiritual meat is essential for spiritual muscle. We can't just stay in the shallow end. We've got to dig deeper into the things of the word, into the principles. That's what we're doing in this series. We're going to go over the attributes of God over the next two weeks. And we're going to get deeper into the things of God, the meat of the word. I don't want to just lead a church that's known for communion crackers on the weekend. And that's great. I love, I love when we can all understand it. But I love when we can go deeper too. Because love never settles for where it is. It always wants to go further. And listen, love doesn't climb higher. Love goes deeper. Scripture is our spiritual protein. It's meat. Here's the next thing. Scripture's like into honey, sugar. Ezekiel 3 verse 1, the voice said to me, Son of man, eat what I'm giving you. Eat this scroll. This is a really important passage for me personally. Then go and give its message to the people of Israel. So eat it first, then go give it. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me the scroll. Fill your stomach with this, the word of God, what, what God is saying. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Psalm 119, 103 says, how sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Now think about this. When you were growing up, which did you love more, vegetables or sweets? Most likely sweets. We tolerated vegetables. We craved sweets. One of the ways you know that Scripture holds the proper place in your life is that you crave it. If you ask my wife what she'd rather have, a full meal at a nice restaurant or chocolate, she doesn't even have to pray about it. Chocolate. Listen, how do you see this book? Do you see it like your favorite candy bar? Do you see it like your favorite pie at Christmas? When you just start thinking about it, you start salivating? Listen, pastors are not the only ones called to salivate over this book. Every one of God's children are supposed to crave this book. Now we'll get out of the food category and we'll move to some utensils. Light, scriptures likened to light. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. What do you do in a dark place when you don't know where you're going? You flip the lights on. Preston, I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this season of my life. I don't know which direction I'm supposed to go. Flip the lights on. Just don't start in Leviticus. <laughs> Get like Psalms, Proverbs, all right? Ecclesiastes. Flip the lights on. In a dark place, when you don't know where you're going, the Bible says, got you covered. Flip the lights on. Here's the next thing. Scripture's likened to a mirror. The Bible's likened to a mirror. James chapter 1, verse 23. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. 
But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for it. Why do you think we're handing out notebooks and notes? And if you don't forget what you heard, we always forget what we hear. Do what it says, don't forget what I heard, then God will bless me for it. The mirror doesn't just reflect where you are, it reflects who you are. There's so many times where you may have walked out of your house on a Sunday morning, heading for church, and you have this thought, I look good today. You didn't even look in the mirror. You have your favorite outfit on. You're just feeling on top of your game. You got a good night's rest. I look good today. Then you come to church. You go into the restroom. You wash your hands, and you're looking into this thing called a mirror, and you notice you have not one, but six different things hanging from the inside of your nose. You don't look quite as good as you thought you did. That's why we have mirrors, to keep us on track. Because we can walk around and say, I look great. But that mirror tells me the truth of where I am. Not just what I look like, of where I am. This book doesn't lie. And I can tell everybody else in my life, I'm doing great. But it isn't until I read this book to know where I actually stand. Because the Bible is like a mirror in our lives. Here's the next thing. It's like a sword. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the sword of the Spirit. This is in the run on the armor of God. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Interesting to note, the sword is the only offensive weapon mentioned in Ephesians 6. The rest are all defensive. For those of you who are athletes, question, can you win a game with zero offense? Probably not. Some smart aleck came up to me after the service last night and said, well, in football, a safety could score running back a touchdown. So I guess you could without offense. I'm like, bro, find another church. <laughs> Kidding, it was a friend. Without a sword, without the offensive weapon, it's a whole lot harder to win. I wonder how many of us spend the bulk of our days with a holstered sword that sits on a dusty nightstand and never gets unholstered. You wanna win? Grab the sword. Here's the last thing scripture's like to that I wanna cover. It's, it's like in the breath. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. This word inspired means breathed. All scripture is God breathed. Now, as we talked about scripture being like milk, if I asked you the question, how long could you go without milk? You'd probably think, well, I'm lactose intolerant, so I don't even do milk. Okay, point taken. If I said, how long could you go without bread without carbs well i'm, I'm gluten-free preston i don't eat bread point taken what about meat well preston i'm a vegetarian okay what about honey i don't do sweets i can live without them okay what about light i don't see that well anyways I'm fine in dark places. Okay. What about a mirror? Oh, I don't ever look at myself in the mirror. I'm fine without one of those. I don't care what other people think about me. Okay. What about a sword? Yeah, I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover. Okay. But let's just say you could live without all of those things in your life. What would your life look like without breath. What would your life look like without oxygen? Shall we try? Shall we test one another and see how long we can go without oxygen in our lungs? I'm begging you with everything inside of me. This book is not a book for ministers who stand on stages. 
This book is a book for children who chase after the Father. You don't need to have a degree to get nuggets out of this book. You have to have an obsession for the author. I can't live without this. It started when I was 13, when my dad challenged me. I'll give you 250 bucks if you read this book cover to cover. The smartest thing my father ever did. I would get up for 6 a.m. before I had to get on the bus. And after days and days, I started to get obsessed. I wasn't a pastor then. I was just a son. I was just a baby in the faith. But something started to happen inside of me, and I realized at 13, I cannot survive without this book. I want this church to be built on this book, not on my opinions, not on my stories. It's this book that saves lives. It's this book that will save yours and mine. Our lives must be built on the rock, and the rock said this is the truth. You can take it to the bank.